and generally we have it in september october next year september we have the conference we will all the participants will get a notice where if you are interested in uh, uh, our organization please try to uh, and also we try to do regional conferences earlier we had a conference with india and uh, this time there will be a regional conference in hong kong so if you want to become a part of this uh, journey please join us and link to our websites so basically we have we award we we try to recognize organizations the buildings uh, who do well and also we have a research fund. It's amazing this year recognition we for, a, we are uh, the privilege. for for this uh, beautiful features in this uh, uh, today where we are trying to uh, this is the first time a Sri Lankan building is recognized by this organization so it is it the category was uh, uh, tall uh, no, uh, best tall non-building so generally a building if it is mo not more than 60 percent it is called non-building it can be a tower it can be a uh, any other structure it is considered. So it, we are we are privileged to uh, win this for Sri Lanka. I also like to acknowledge the contributions from TRCSL, DRFT, the contractor, and University of Moratuba, and our group, and CAIC, the contractor, and Alit, the country, uh, the partner contractor of this organization. It's a, it's a great privilege that we have. Uh, we uh, it's an honor that we bought this uh, to Sri Lanka. So, uh, so basically, uh, we organize uh, talks. Uh, generally, Colombo Forum is in this uh, time, sometimes in June. And also, uh, we are having a similar, uh, another conference in Kandy on the 16th. So if you, if you uh, I uh, wish uh, all of you will join us um, in these uh, these forums, in order to uh, walk the journey with us. So once again, thank you for joining uh, today uh, today to uh, uh, for this conference. We have wonderful speakers uh, from. Uh, we will be talking about mass timber construction, health, uh, building health, and hydrogen future. So they are very important topics which we thought to. Uh, discuss with the industry leaders. So uh, we have all the leaders here uh, and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirama. I now invite the Vice President of CTBUH Sri Lanka, Architect Nirodha Gunadasa, to introduce the theme for the evening. Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody. So uh, welcome to this uh, CTBH uh, conference. So my duty is to introduce the theme this time, the future sustainable cities for you. Okay, let me begin. Okay, so this is our world where we live in and we have more than 7 billion people in this world living now and it is rising now and uh, estimated that by 2100, there will be about 11 billion people here. Thing is, is it a problem? Yeah, it is a problem because uh, according to the way these 7 billion people consume scarce resources today, right now we require one and a half planets. We have only one planet, so that is one problem. So this graph shows the carbon emissions by nations. Uh, United Nations 
one citizen emits 14.4 tons of carbon dioxide per annum. So that is the emission by US. And China, it is less slow, but uh, it is rising. India and uh, if you look at uh, India and Africa, it is very low, but it is rising now. Everybody is going to be like Americans. So if everybody in the world start to live like Americans in coming years, we require four planets to sustain them. So that is the problem we have today. So what is the solution for this? Is this the solution? So if we, everybody in the world, if they start to live in villages like this, will it solve the problem? If 11 billion people start to live like this, it will take up massive amount of natural land. It will take up massive road networks and massive infrastructure networks. So it is not the solution. In fact, it is the problem. So we have to find a way to compact people and make them live in a, in a squeezed manner. So today, billions of people are moving into cities. And by doing so, knowing or unknowing, they are actually contributing to make the world a more sustainable place. So mega cities of the world are at a tremendous growth today. So if you look at New Delhi, uh, it is expected by 2025, New Delhi will have about 43% growth uh, in comparison to what it is today. And uh, same with Dhaka. Dhaka, there will be 53% growth. Beijing, there will be 44% growth. And even uh, in New York City, we think it is now almost developed, but it, it is going to grow 20%. So this is uh, how people lived in the world in cities. So 1980s, only about 39% of global population lived in cities. In numbers, it is about 1.7 billion. And 2015, we have more than half of the world population living in cities, and it is 3.9 billion. And it is expected by 2050, the world population 6.4 billion will live in cities. It is almost the number of total number of people living in the world today. And 66% of the population will live in cities. So look at these numbers, 3.9 billion today, 6.4 billion in 2050. So by 2050, there will be 3 billion people living in cities. We need cities for 3 billion people. And almost it's a doubling of the global urban population. So this is the greatest force, although we don't notice it. So this is the greatest force in the world that is happening and we have to face it. So unless we get this right, unless we get this urbanization right, all these climate uh, solutions you're talking about are not going to save the planet Earth. So this is the major trend we have to attend to. And cities are not only becoming larger, today cities are becoming smart as well. So information is doing a major role. So difference between 1980 city and a city today, smart city today is like uh, the telephone in 1980s and a smartphone today. So that kind of a huge difference is there in smart cities. So uh, we have mega data about traffic flows, live data, how a traffic moves inside a city, how people flow in cities, uh, how energy is conceived in cities in different areas, how it changes, how temperature changes in a city in different areas, and how air quality changes in a city, uh, and how it dynamically moves. So we have all this data now. And with this massive data and techn technological advancements, Cities now can react like living organisms, like my skin react to the AC, the cities are beginning to react to things. So future cities are becoming smart and they are becoming sustainable. So that is our theme for today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nirodha.
As many of you are aware, the Lotus Tower, under the visionary leadership of General Prasad Samarasinghe, has recently been honored with the prestigious award for the best tall non-building at the CTBUH World Conference of 2023. It is now my great pleasure to invite our chief guest for today, the driving force behind this incredible accomplishment, General Prasad Samarasinghe, the CEO of Lotus Tower Management. Please join us on stage. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and it's an honor. I am honored today to be here because I am not a, a professional like you all, but as a chief guest of the CTBU uh, Colombo uh, Forum today, I am uh, honored and I am really happy that I can, I can address a, a gathering like this. And I must thank Mr. Shiromal. Uh, and Professor Priyan and all the CTBUH uh, uh, committee members and all of you. And good evening, everybody. I am not going to talk about technical things because I don't know like you all. But I am going to tell you about how we have come, come through all these uh, white elephant up to now, up, not up to now, certain uh, period, how it has started and now how we have transformed it and what we are trying to do. That's what I am going to educate or uh, rather inform you. So this project, I'll just briefly uh, explain because I was also involved initially with Mr. Sheromal and Professor Priyan in this project with the uh, TRC SL and Morato University uh, Provisors team because I was in the army and I was appointed as the uh, coordinator of this project from the Defense Ministry in 2012. This project started in 2012. Initially, it was only for 104 million US dollars project. Uh, it was to complete by 2015 May, but it did not complete. Uh, they could not complete it by 2015. Then by that time, initially the loan amount, the uh, Exim Bank has approved is 88 million US dollars. But by 2015, they have dispersed only about uh, only 67 million US dollars. But balance they are not given after 2016. So this project was dragging on. And in 2019, some people have opened it, but we were given, we were asked in 2021, I was asked and I was attached to the TRC uh, to go and take over this project and see what we can do. So I got stuck at the, I got stuck in the lifts, not only myself, TRC, uh, TRC DG and uh, all the telco chairmans, Supun, the dialogue chairman, uh, SLT chairman, all we got stuck for 15 minutes in the lifts because lifts were not maintained properly. That was the history. So, uh, but we have started paying the loan and now only 14 million uh, to be paid. But uh, up to now, they have used 113 million US dollars that all the money, balance money used by Sri Lanka, our TRCSA and all our taxpayers' money. So it was closed until 2022, February 28th, only the Chinese company handed over the tower to uh, TRCSA. So I must thank all the engineers and except, I, I, in fact, all Monterey University people, and as well as all uh, professors from Provisor, then Chiromal and a lot of engineers got together and got this thing uh, corrected. When there were 21 major defects in 2021, when we tried to take over, it was not, uh, we could not take over because of that. So, but all those uh, things were corrected and we took over by uh, 2022, February 28th. But the TRCSL could not uh, do any business because uh, the act, say, act does not allow them to do business. So this company, which I am the CEO now, was formed under the treasury, that is Colombo Lotus Tower Management Company, Private Limited. And we, the company got this tower for 50 years on lease from TRCSL. First two years, we had to pay 100 million each. Then after the second year, it will be renegotiated. So in 2012, the ROI, 
the plan was something else because at that time uh, the main income they were expecting is was from the tower mast but up to now tower mast nobody is using so then we came up with another plan i must thank all the volunteers in 2021 in fact i must thank shiromal mainly because shiromal's team voluntarily gave us all the support and we got so many other volunteers from the country and we formed a team to see how we can uh, build, uh how we can uh, what do you call this uh, model it as a profit earning uh, project so we got a lot of brainstorming done and we got a, we came up with a plan how to uh, how to get this uh, business as a business model so i must thank everybody those who supported also but now i will just give you a small presentation i'll do a small presentation my business development manager will do it how it was and how it is now and what we are trying to achieve within 14 months we started this in 2000 we opened to the public in 2022 september 15th up to yesterday we have got 1.3 million odd local tourist local people Uh, visitors and uh, almost forty thousand tourists. All those people, those who have come, buying tickets to go to observation deck only. But there are so many others which we don't know how many people have come because uh, there were so many outdoor events. Uh, there are seventy, uh, so more than seventy odd events we have conducted. So we have made it. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I am very happy with my team. We have only seventy one people, young people, and within a short period. We were able to uh, get a revenue of one thousand twenty five point three million Sri Lankan rupees without a single cent from the government. We are we are using all, all our revenue and the profits. We have we have our our opex was only six hundred eighteen million for the last fifteen months. Balance all profit, and government has not given a single cent. Initially, they gave capital. Uh, so rather, uh, treasury gave. Uh, 500 million to us for development work we have used about uh, 350 million out of that and balance also we have now planned and already uh, things are happening there uh, for that that is uh, construction work going on so with that i will just hand over to him after that i'll uh, once he finish i'll ask any questions from you all or i'll answer any questions from the audience if there are thank you Good evening, everyone. So, thank you once again for inviting us, Mr. Romal and the team. Uh, I'll make it very quick. Won't take a long time, and it'll be fun and exciting. And let's see how many things like uh, what we have incorporated uh, into this in terms of the sustainability, digitalization, collecting data, and so on and so forth. So, I'll quickly go through everything. Uh, like General mentioned earlier, so with the help of a lot of volunteers, with the professionals, we managed to crack down on three main pillars. That is one for education. The second one is technology, and the third one is entertainment. So, Lotus Tower is basically built upon these three main pillars. So that's how we have went to the market. When, uh, like General mentioned, so when we were ready to go to the market, we were actually not hundred percent ready because it was not commercially ready to go to the market because there were a lot of problems and things like that. Then we uh, managed to crack down on three main pillars, and then we pursue on these three main IT uh, areas to like you know see how we can bring in the investors and things like that. So this is how we got the tower. So like General mentioned, so I'm just going to visually emphasize on certain things as well, so you will get a like a perspective on what kind of a challenging environment that we had to play around with. Uh, most of the areas were like you know not even ready to utilize, and we can't even show this to a. Uh, investor. So this is how we got the tower uh, from the uh, relevant departments. And then after that, this is how we convert the tower. So this is not the 100% done product, but it's going somewhere. So we know for a fact that we have to reinvest certain things that you know we are already collecting. Uh, so strategically, slowly, we are getting things done. So this is how it looks now. Uh, and all of you know by now, so we have opened our revolving restaurant, so most awaited revolving restaurant in South Asia. So this was a big win for us. Again, we invested around 200 million into this project. Uh, we managed to like, you know, conceptualize things, how to have the marketing plan, 
and all sorts of things and to like, you know, utilize it the way that we want and to like, you know, bring in the business to the company. Uh, so strategically to get an idea of the Lotus Tower, I'm sure that, you know, most of you have come to Lotus Tower, most of you haven't. Uh, so I will quickly go through the each segment on what is what. Uh, so basement, you have a basement kitchen, so it can cater to around 1,500 packs. That's what the food will take it to the uh, tower house that we call the Pohutu Padi Tower House. And then the ground floor, we have food courts, ice cream parlors, kids play area. So mainly like, you know, F&B side of the things. And then the first floor, we uh, talk about the technology side of it. So it's something to cover today's topic as well. Uh, so the innovation centers, tech zones and things like that, it's not 100% confirmed yet. And a uh, uh, lot of work to be done as well in that in terms of bringing in more investors. We have dialogue innovation centers and things like that. Then the second floor, we have a big win. So we got the casino for, the, for Lotus Tower, so which brings around closer to around 49 million a month a rent, uh, which we can sustain without the observation deck and we can run our daily operation and to make sure that you know we sustain into the future as well. And they recently got the casino license as well, so which is another big win for us. And the third floor, we have a, I mean, a, like a kids play area, like an open deck area. So where you can like, you know, have a leisure area and things like that, much more advanced than like, you know, usual parks that you have in Sri Lanka. Like if you go to a water park or things like that, this is a much more sophisticated, much more leisurely you can really enjoy kind of park. And then seventh floor, we have the observation deck, which is the bread and butter for us right now. Sixth floor, we have six luxury suites. So what I'm talking about in this space right now, uh, fifth floor, we have the revolving restaurant, which is the... Uh, blue orbit, the banquet, the revolving that we have. Fourth floor, fourth floor, and the third floor, we have two banquets, uh, two cosmic spaces, so which we have opened one to the public as well. And the first and the second floors are pretty much for the technical uh, floors and things like that. So to get an overview of the tower, so this is uh, the tower from the first to the ninth floors, like you know what uh, height are these are in, and how many packs you can accommodate in each uh, floor is what is said in this. Uh, then if you break down into the ground floor, so this is the ground floor allocation. So we clearly mentioned like, you know, what kind of elements that comes in the ground floor area. So Colombo Lotus Tower digital canvas. So what we call is the uh, digital art museum is coming to the core area, uh, which is a very sophisticated, again, a very digitalized experience to the public that who comes. Uh, I will go into detail on that as well. And then we have a casino operation, one outlet, a couple of outlets, taxi stand, ice cream parlors, and lots of things happening in the ground floor like i said earlier like the ground floor is mainly focused on the fnb side of the things so people can come and indulge some of good food and things like that then we have the first floor so the commercial allocation is for the first floor is like predominantly focused on the technology aspect of it uh, so we have auditoriums our own offices as well eventually we have to move out from that and again focus on renting out to the relevant uh, uh, renting spaces for the commercial purposes but for now, we are bringing in VR, arcade games, and things like that. These are not things that you see in a like normal mall. So these are like you know much more advanced technology that we are bringing into Lotus Tower. So if you drop in, do come call us. So then we'll give you the tour to get a more in-depth idea of this. Uh, so these are the biggest uh, wins we have for the past fifteen months. So like you know we are going to sign up with Abseiling. So we did multiple runs on this. And then we did Gobanji, so Gobanji contracts are being signed. Digital Art Museum, like I mentioned, that is already done. So we'll be opening in February. Uh, Lotus by the Lake is pretty much focused on mostly entertainment, cultural shows and things like that to target the foreign inbound. So the Lotus Aqua Bay is again targeted mainly uh, foreigners and also like, you know, the water related activities. And then again, the casino operation, like I mentioned earlier. So when it comes to the... Uh, East Bay Lake. So in front of Lotus Tower, there's a massive area of East Bay Lake. So that that's the targeted area. So uh, under the SLLDC, so we partner up with them. So we told them that, you know, we know the significant part of it. So might as well give it to us. We will give you a rent on that because it hasn't been utilized for so long. And then we gave them a, a proposal. So which they uh, pretty much okay with it. So we have put it to a board and all of that. So we are waiting for that clearance. And then what we are going to do is like, we're going to execute this plan. So the boat operators, the jet skis and everything is ready to go. The only pause is in this is pretty much to get that sign off document from SLLDC. So again, like I mentioned earlier, so Lotus by the Lake is pretty much focused on the inbound tourists targeted that uh, community. 
we will be selling a ticket and like you know the inbound tour agents can buy the ticket in groups and then like you know we can showcase the uh entertainment tax so exactly something like in singapore and all of the other big countries so these are some of the uh, events that we have done in the private area so this is lotus by the lake area uh, this was a concept that uh, we recently developed there uh, so this is the warehouse project another a massive project that's going to come into lotus cover so we have a 42,000 odd uh, warehouse uh, space in here. And then we wanted to convert this into a, like a, a warehouse where people can do indoor event as well with the current weather and things like that. This was planned out long time back. So now we are in the process of finalizing certain things as well. So with that, we will do in the trade shows, live concerts, exhibitions, conferences, solar project, uh, all of that in this as well. So solar project mainly what we are working with currently is to like you know have it on the roof at least somewhat we can uh, generate a certain amount of power to power up the Lotus Tower as well. So that's the strategical framework that we have on the warehouse right now. Uh, so this is the 15 meter level. So like I mentioned earlier, so this will be a leisure park kind of area. We are bringing down certain equipment from China, which we have already purchased. So that will come uh, very soon, maybe end of next month. So that will be done and people can come and enjoy some uh, great food and entertainment and things like that. So I'll go to the extreme sport category that we are doing. So I will showcase some of the videos. For the first time, I'm showing some of the videos as well. Some of the videos you all have already seen. So uh, these are some of the extreme sport and also the type of the tower and also the opportunities that we have in this tower that no one has seen before. So I think uh, this is what we have done. So enjoy. Uh, sorry. So... To begin that, I just wanted to tell one more thing. So this is the 15 meter uh, draft design plan that we have. So the uh, overlook of the plan with Mr. Shiromal's team actually did it. So before we jump into the uh, extreme sport category, I'll just like quickly showcase in this as well. again i will speak on top of this so you will get an idea so this is the outdoor entertainment space that we have planned out where people can come and sit enjoy a movie so we want to screen the movies for free for the public without charging them but to come to this space the third floor of lotus tower will be a ticket for 200 rupees but after that once they come on the top we will be screening we will be theming out certain movies like two different different themes and then the kids and all of that, they come and they can watch the screening. And the screening times and everything will be posted on our socials and our website and things like that. So this is a completely brand new experience that people who can't afford to go to a movie theater who's coming from really far away so they can experience this kind of movie. So we have already purchased the LED screens and things like that. Uh, I would say 15 to 20% of the project is done, but uh, we got uh, Mr. Shiromal's team to like, you know, emphasize on the architectural designs and things like that. So we are in that phase. So like I mentioned earlier, so these are the children's play equipment. These are basic ones. These are not the ones that are going to come, but this is basically the layout of the whole concept. What is going to happen on uh, third floor of the Lotus Tower. With the time, I will just quickly skip. Uh, so coming back to the uh, digital art museum. So this is the concept that we have. Again, I'll just like do the walkthrough while just like explaining it to you. So what we have here is like we will showcase the heritage, the culture of Sri Lanka and the technology side of it and things like that. So this initial concept was again like done way back with the, the volunteer team that General mentioned earlier. So what we did was like we looked at certain vendors in Sri Lanka who can actually pull this off and then we found a company so with this went to the bidding processes we did multiple presentations and proposals uh, evaluating them and things like that and they bring down that right technology uh, and to like you know execute this so pretty much uh, I would say 80% of the work is done uh, we are in the content phase of it so hopefully we can finish everything very soon and open to the public as well again this will also be ticketed just to recover our cost for the investment but uh, hopefully like after two to three years we will be trying to streamline the ticketing process as well uh, so talking about the extreme sport category so i start with this so the abseiling project so we have two companies who already pitched for us we're going to select one company uh, hopefully by next week 
Uh, then after that, we will be starting the abseiling. So it will be ticketed. People can purchase ticket and do the abseiling as well. So this is the base jump event, the very first base jump event that we did uh, with two extreme sport base jumpers. So enjoy. <laughs>
And then these are the events that we have done, just general mentioned earlier. So we have bring in quite a lot of youth and like, you know, different segment of the target audience that we would like uh, to do multiple events at Lotus Tower. So this event was like 9,000 kind of footfall. Uh, one of the biggest events that happened at Lotus Tower. And this is the October first that we did at uh, Lotus Tower. And uh, quite a lot of things happened in that area as well. Uh, so to talk about it, I think General already covered this area as well. So the footfall for now is like 1 million plus. So for the past couple of, I mean, most of the months that we have like, you know, operated and the foreign visitors is around 40K. So uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, Mr. Shiromal and the team. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you, General Prasad and uh, Bimsara Rosario for the very interesting presentation. We extend our heartfelt gratitude for gracing this occasion with your presence. Your acceptance of our invitation is a testament to the importance of the milestone achieved by the Colombo Lotus Tower and the impact it has had on the global stage. Our first keynote speaker of the evening is an eminent personality in the field of energy engineering. He's a professor of energy engineering at the University of Melbourne and has had made remarkable contributions to the domain of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Professor Lue has established an internationally recognized research cluster, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficient Group in 2008 at the university. Since then, he has been leading the group. He has over 40 years of engineering experience in higher education, research development, demonstration and commercialization of low carbon technologies. His research areas include heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration systems, solar energy engineering, waste and waste to resources, and complex systems modeling. He has been recognized as a leading expert in optimization and forecasting of complex system behaviors. Professor A applied phenomenological modeling and simulation approaches for optimizing energy systems. He also utilized computational and participatory approaches for modeling socio-ecological systems under deep uncertainty. The system models have been applied to identify the effects of policy interventions and robust decision making. He authored and co-authored over 350 peer-reviewed scientific publications. I now invite Professor Lue to address the gathering. We acknowledge the importance of our relationship to the traditional owner of the land. I pay my respect to the traditional custodian of the land and extend the respect to other indigenous people. I also would like to thank engineer Shiromo Fernando, CTBUH country representative Sri Lanka and Professor Priya Mendes from Melbourne University. The topic that I'm going to talk about is energy efficiency and healthy tall building. First thing I would like to talk about is energy efficiency. When we are talking about energy efficiency, we should look at both sides. In this diagram, I am not quite sure you will be able to read it through or not. I will take you through. And traditional system, if you want one unit of, sorry, one unit of light, we need to provide 320 units of input. So assuming that power generation is about 35% efficient and the transmission is efficient 95% and distribution system is efficient 95% and the wiring is about 99% and lamp efficiency is about 2% and the fitting efficiency about 50%. So if you want one unit of output, useful light, we need about 320 units of input. So there are a lot of losses in the system. 
if you look at this line number two in there, if you look at power generation efficiency increase from 35% to 50%, your input will become 224. Okay, so in that third line, if you improve efficiency from 2% to 10%, the overall input will be 64 units. So if you do it both side and supply side, power generation efficiency increase up to 50%, and the lamp efficiency increase up to 10%, the total input will be 44.8%. So it means if you want better energy efficiency, we've got to improve from both sides, supply side and demand side. And what do we want? We want energy services. We don't want energy. We don't want brown coal. We don't want oil. We don't want petrol. We want transport. Okay. We want services provided by the energy. For example, service is the, in this diagram, top one is an emailing grandma. Okay. And if you look at that, we have a service technology like laptop and mobile phone. And you will have a distribution technology like power sub power line. And you will also have a, what we call the tower. And then you will have a electric electricity as a energy input. So to have the electricity, we need to do that. What we call, we've got to harvest a technology and that technology will harvest from the nature. For example, in VRSA, wind turbine capturing that electricity and electricity distributed through, and then we use laptop and the mobile phone to write email to our grandma. Okay, so that's a, one of the examples of service. And second example in here is a visiting grandma. So if we are visiting grandma, we will use the car. If you are using car, you will have a, we got to distribute the petrol to the station so that we can use it, we can have petrol in our car. So we got to distribute tanker or the truck distribution system there. And then we transport gasoline or petrol there. And we got to have the petrol. We got to harvest that one from the ground. And then that's come from the millions of year under the ground. So fossil fuel there. And by the way, I teach solar energy engineering. I would say all the energy come from sun. So the important points in here is that we want energy services. People are focusing on energy. We are calculating based on how much is per kilowatt hour. Actually, how much is per email? That's the service we want. So we need to be careful with when we use energy units, when we calculation per service. That's the more important one. And this is an important one. If you are going to improve energy, there are several ways of doing things. And some people start talking about renewable energy. Okay. So in this pyramid, first thing we should be doing is uh, when we make decision, we got to look at first thing, how much that we use, how much can we improve? Analysis of energy. That's a basic one. So we got to look at that energy analysis. It's a basic for so all kinds. If you are going to improve system, we've got to have an analysis done first. After that, we can conserve the energy. Conserve the energy means if we can avoid using the energy, and we should conserve the energy. For example, do we need all those 16 lights in here? If you can reduce, if we can take it out eight, so we are conserving energy. Okay, that's a one way of doing it. And before we do that, we got to analyze. If you take out eight, what will be the quantitative, how much we are going to save the energy. So that's a part of energy conservation calculation. And the, another one is the energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, improving the output for the same input. For example, lighting efficiency, you change it to LED, you have a better efficiency. That's, we call it energy efficiency. That's the third stage we should be considering. And the fourth stage is uh, time or use management, especially if you are using electricity supply and demand. 
we don't store electricity. We use it at the same time, generation efficiency, sorry, generation and usage must match. So for example, if you have a peak time, we can reduce the electricity use. That's what we call time of use management. Last thing we should be looking at is uh, renewable energy. So first thing, we do the analysis. Second, we conserve the energy if we can avoid using energy. And third one, improve the efficiency. And the fourth one is a management of the usage time. And the fifth one is a try out renewable energy. Okay, the topic is about healthy building. How is this relevant to energy efficiency and the one that we are going to discuss? The definition Shiramo asked me, what is the definition? I remember three things, health, well-being, and productivity. That's a definition provided by Harvard University. And a healthy building is one with an indoor environment that is optimized to positively embed the health, human health, and well-being, mental health, and our productivity of occupant. Okay, so there are several items in here. If you look at from the 12 o'clock, number one is a ventilation, number two is a air quality, number three is a thermal health, and number four is a moisture in the building, number five is a dust and the pest. Okay, and if you look at that right hand side, out of nine foundation, five of them very much relevant to heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Okay, so let's have a look at HVAC system. First thing is that we need to understand indoor environment. That's what we want to control. What is happening in indoor environment? Indoor environment is affected by several things in there. Okay, first one is the occupant ourselves. Ourselves generate pollutant. When we breathe out the air, air is saturated with moisture. Okay, and we also shed skin flake. Okay, that's a skin coming out of people that occupant generate carbon dioxide. When we breathe in, oxygen taken out, and the one we breathe out, carbon dioxide coming out. So that's a pollutant ourselves generating. Okay, we also generate odor, smell. Okay, so these are the affected by occupant and occupant also generate heat. Within this room, if we sit in very long, at least, you know, 70 watt, 60 watt, depends on the activity that you do, we generate heat within the building. We generate heat, we generate moisture by breathing out, by sweating. So another one is a building fit out. Building fit out means the carpet that we use and the paint that we use, everything affects the indoor environment, okay? If you have a carpet, very new new carpet, that may have a, what we call, effects on the smell, okay? So that could also affect it by building envelope. If you look at the building envelope, we have walls, window, floor, and the ceiling. They also affect our heat and mass transfer to the building. So these are the things, and building envelope outside, we have the outdoor environment. If you look at outdoor environment, we have that, you know, ever-changing solar radiation and the air temperature and the water vapor outside. So these things affect building. And to make that indoor air environment acceptable for us, we have the HVAC system. In here, a red one represents energy transfer. Energy can be in and out. And then we also have a mass transfer. For example, moisture can be in and out. Air pollutant can be in and out of that system. Okay? So the important point in here is that indoor air environment is a complex dynamic system. Complex means it's happening, it's transient, it's changing all the time. And dynamics is changing all the time. Okay, so it says main physical transfer phenomenon. We have the heat transfer, we have the mass transfer, we also have the movement and transfer, airflow. All three things need to be considered. And these are continuous interaction between outside environment and indoor environment. So human intervention or control. We control that 
HVAC system by controlling indoor environment. So if you look at roles of HVAC system that control ventilation, for example, in this room, we may have a outside air, fresh air coming in and recirculation air that controlled by ventilation and air quality also controlled by HVAC system. Air quality means dilution and filtration. We could dilute the air with outside air. We could filter the air with filter, okay? And another one is a thermal comfort, thermal health, we call it, and that also important. And moisture in the room also controlled by HVAC system, dust and pollutant from the pets also controlled by the HVAC system. So HVAC system is very important for healthy environment for your indoor. And tall building. And I don't have to convince you about why we need tall building. That in the introduction section, urbanization, increased land prices, and high population density. So these three things make us require tall buildings there. Okay. And the benefits we get is uh, occupy less land area, obviously, and the steel structure flame, we also use it, and glass exterior covering, these are the general ones, okay? So if you look at tall building, what are the important ones, challenges there? If you look at tall building, if you look at, at the top level and the ground level, they have different temperature. For example, top level may have cooling, sorry, cooler environment, and the bottom level may have a warmer environment. So they have the different temperature, it means different cooling level, okay? So, and sometimes if you have a lot of solar radiation at the top, your top parts of the building will be heat, okay? It's not like traditional building control. If you are heating this room, you may be able to heat the other room at the same time. However, in the tall building, heating and cooling can happen at the same time. That makes us challenges. And another one is that if you look at tall building, limited roof space. If you look at the roof, area is very small and conventional system, they are heavy, bulky, so we have less space. So, and there are three solutions. That's uh, what we call first two solution are traditionally at this moment, best practice we use. And for example, multiple HVAC zone for 12 to 15 flow combined together. And each zone could have its own HVAC system that's happening around the world. However, I was told by Shiromo in the morning, and we have individual system, individual level, individual apartment. So I learned something today. Thank you, Shiromo. Yeah, that's a reality because we want the control by the tenant because tenants in the multiple ownership, individual control is important. That's why we don't combine, we don't combine things together. Like in US, it's a combined together because they have the, what you call different usage. Okay. And another one is a zone HVAC system allow more flexible indoor climate control. Because if you combine, if you have a hundred flows and you are controlling about 10 flow, easier to control. Okay, smaller system, and that's a good. And the, another one I want to introduce is a heat recovery ventilator. And heat recovery ventilator is a lot common in Canada and New Zealand coming in there, but they recover heat. We could reverse the flow to recover the coolness. And if you have a air conditioning cool, if you want a fresh air, we need to throw away that cool air outside. Okay, so we're gonna bring in fresh air. Outside fresh air is warmer fresh air. So we gotta do that, what you call coolness recovery. I think this is the next step there. And before we talk about coolness recovery, I want to talk about what are the elements impact on indoor environment quality. Indoor environment quality is affected by several things, okay? That's acoustic, we don't understand the indoor air quality, it means indoor air pollutant, what sort of pollutant inside of there. And we've got to look at the thermal comfort. You also need to know about 
how do we make it light? Okay. For example, acoustic control our well-being. If you have a noisy things happening at the same time, that make us crazy. You know, mental health, well-being there, and then air quality. Make sure that we have the comfortable one and the thermal comfort. If it is bad, too cold, too hot, we are not feeling uh, well. So health also important, and the lighting is also depends on the task we do. Reading, we must have the right level of lighting. So productivity control. So. And here, especially thermal comfort is controlled by heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. We control air temperature. We control relative humidity. We also control mean radiant heat temperature. If you are near the, what we call, windows with very high solar radiation, we may be feeling hot in there. So that we will have a external shading or internal shading to control the mean radiant temperature. Okay. For thermal comfort for us, affected by three things, what sort of clothing we wear, we have metabolic rate, and we also have the air velocity. If you want coolness, you could do fan yourself. Okay, So these are the things. These are the brief introduction to indoor environment quality there. Okay. This slide tells us about heat recovery ventilator. If you look at this in here, this is heat recovery that we use in winter time, okay? For example, we have the inside air and at the bottom, it's going out, okay? Outside air is cooler and then that exchange heat in there and then outside air warm up that come into the room. So that's a heat recovery. If you ch change that inside and outside, let's say inside in this right-hand side, outside it on the left hand side, that will be recovering coolness. Okay. Inside, we are throw away the cool air because we want a fresh air in, because whatever coming in, we got to take it out. So before we do that, outside air will be hot. That hot air exchange heat with the cool air and that come into the room. That will save energy. If you have a very good system in the literature, they said about 95% could be recovered. Okay, 95% of the heat could be recovered. We have written that paper in 2000, and sorry for the typo there, I should have finished that, 2000, and that paper available. We look at the coolness recovery, because at that time, heat recovery is very popular, and then coming into place. And nowadays, because Outdoor air is more and more important. If you want pathogen or viruses to clear out, we want 100% fresh air, like operating theater. Okay, so hospital air, quality air, we could have in this one. And I haven't seen practical apply that system in there. So Shiramo may be the first one to install that and test it out. Okay, so by changing the flow arrangement, Heat recovery can be used as cool recovery. Okay. And these are the conclusions I would like to make. First is that both supply side and demand side technology need to be considered when we talk about energy efficiency improvement. And if you want to reduce carbon intensity, we got to consider both. And some people are talking about decarbonizing the electricity supply system. Some people are talking about reducing the energy use in the building. We got to do both together. That way we could have a better, what we call energy efficiency improvement, okay? Energy services and the tasks performed by energy, these are the ones we should be focusing on. Not how much energy that we use, what sort of services provided by energy. For example, how much can we cool this room? Okay, that's a service that provided how much lighting level we get out of that, okay? So when we are calculating performance based on the services provided, for example, how much money do we need to provide that level of lighting in here? So these are the one we should be focusing on, okay? Quantitative energy analysis, I don't have to emphasize on that. Shiramo got a lot of software, I was told, it's free, very cheap, and 
Quantitative analysis is very important. Without knowing the number, we don't know where we are going. We don't know what we are doing. We don't even know whether we are improving or not. Quantitative analysis, quantitative measurement, these are very important, okay? And when we are considering, we should be starting with quantitative analysis and after that, energy conservation, energy efficiency, time of view energy management and renewable energy should be the last one to consider, okay? Effective and efficient HVAC system are very important for the healthy building. If you want to look at healthy building, you can't do away with heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. That's a very important one. Building services engineer will play a yeah, bigger role in that one, okay? Multi-use tall building, they have more complexity than single occupant buildings there, as you know. And HRV, which may be applied as a cool recovery, these are air exchange system that enhance indoor air quality and that reduce operating costs. We got to have a two birds with one stone, okay? That improve indoor air quality plus also reduce operating costs. And this is my email. If you would like to have this PowerPoint, I think available through the CTBUH. And yeah, if you have question, you can send me email. And thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, questions. Do I take questions? At the oh, end. we're going with the time. At the end? No. At the end, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Liu. Let's take a moment to express our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Liu. I hope you enjoyed the profound insights shared by Professor Liu on energy efficient, healthy, tall buildings. Now we move forward to another captivating session in our, uh, with our second keynote speaker of the night. Our next speaker is a distinguished expert in the field of alternative fuels, renowned for his groundbreaking work and innovative contributions. Dr. Damit has engaged in many research and consultation projects. He was a key member of the Defense Science and Technology Organization Eureka Prize-winning team for Outstanding Science in Safeguarding Australia in 2013. In addition to his academic experience, Dr. Damit has worked in the construction and consultation industries for many years, holding different positions. Damit Mahoti is a well-recognized researcher and a consultant in engineering consultancy and defense science sectors. Dr. Damit has established himself as one of Australia's emerging scientists in critical infrastructure protection within a very small time frame. He has engaged in many different research projects in his area and have won several project contribution awards, among them being a member of the Eureka Prize winning team for Safeguarding Australia in 2013 can be considered as the highest achievement. He was awarded an Engineering Excellence Award in 2017 by the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka. An SW brand for the publication of a novel concept of using polyurethane coated com composite aluminium plates in damage mitigation of high velocity projectile impacts. Dr. Damit's extensive contribution towards the success of the Defense Material Technology Center projects has earned himself several projects contribution awards. Most of Dr. Damit's research efforts are aimed to, at keeping people safe and protecting them from both natural and human caused disasters. Dr. Damit is passionate about developing better design techniques for structures to survive under such extreme loading. I now invite Dr. Damit to conduct his session. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Shiromal Pranandu and the team in for inviting me for this occasion to deliver a speech on the work we are doing in hydrogen infrastructure, especially focusing on the safety aspect of future hydrogen projects. I'm a senior lecturer at University of New South Wales, 
we are located in this beautiful city. We are thinking about sustainable cities. It's one of them in the world. Canberra, beautiful city. They're thinking about more and more sustainability in their infrastructure development. It's a good, real good example anyone to take into account when they are developing sustainable environment. Just to introduce myself, where I'm from, I'm working at UNSW Canberra, which is attached to Australian Defence Force Academy, mainly working as a service provider for Australian Defence, private forces generally. So I work closely with Professor Mendes as well. He's one of my mentors and professional mentors as well. And it is a honor to share the podium with him, especially in the same session, delivering a talk to you about hydrogen infrastructure. Why is hydrogen important? This is a question that we need to ask from us in today's context. We are searching because of the fuel price and we are trying to achieve net zero targets in many developed countries are pushing hard towards alternative fuels. So what are the options we have? One of them is hydrogen. Hydrogen considered as one of the main options we have at this moment on the table. There are many others, but considering the advantages we have from hydrogen, at this moment, many developed countries pumping huge amount of research funding into this sector to see whether they can develop this into a achievable targets or to get this running in five to 10 years time so that they have alternative solution for fossil fuels. Why hydrogen is important? One is hydrogen can be considered as renewable and it's readily available. We all know hydrogen can be abstract or obtained from water. If you process water, we can obtain hydrogen. So consider as most abundant element in the earth at this moment, we call hydrogen. So there's an opportunity. If we can use that technology to obtain hydrogen, we can replace our fossil fuels with this miracle material. Then when it's come to feasible energy side, hydrogen can be considered as a very big competitor for many other fuels. Not like other fuels where we emit CO2 and other gases, hydrogen won't do any other, won't emit any other gases. It's just H2O plus some heat into the environment. So you can see the advantage already. When it's come to hydrogen, it's just that water as an output plus additional heat into the environment. When you compare hydrogen as an energy source with something like diesel, three, if you think about the same mass, hydrogen is three times generally powerful than diesel type of energy source. So we discuss about three advantages. The fourth one can be reduce of carbon footprint. Clearly it's on the card as well. So if any country is going towards net zero targets, this is a number one element need to consider in terms of the future energy. In addition to that, I like to highlight, there are many others, but I didn't want to highlight here. The noise pollution, is considerably less. The engines, especially during the combustion, the noise generated by hydrogen fuel combustion is significantly lower than hydrocarbon fuels. So these are the main advantages we have when it comes to hydrogen as an energy source. There are ways that we can 
achieve this target or generate hydrogen, starting from renewables, nuclear sources, fossils as well. We develop, we use that energy and generate electricity to some extent. Then we create hydrogen using that small amount of energy. And we, the advantage of creating hydrogen there is we can store them until we need. This is the advantage, main advantage of that. Now, world is moving towards renewable source purely because to reduce even, even small amount of possible carbon footprint if it is coming from other different sources. So if you see global movement towards this direction, especially countries like Australia, if you see the numbers, Australia has invested 1.2 billion for hydrogen industry to achieve their target of achieving net zero by 2050. So they are moving already into that. But comparatively, it's a lesser amount to the American American government's spend, uh, investment. It's a 50 billion public investment has gone into this sector. Huge amount. No other country has invested that amount at this moment. And many ways, they have invested money into this sector to get this, to achieve their targets and as a leader of hydrogen fuel in, in near future. So if you see over 1,000 hydrogen energy projects worth of 320 billion have been defined for 2024 already. This can be higher even when we are moving into the first half of the year 2024. So you can see here clearly there's a global move towards this direction. I want to compare this and explain to you again and highlight clearly the, the direction that we are heading, especially in terms of consumption of hydrogen as well as the production of green hydrogen. Because I mentioned previously, now current trend is to work towards the green hydrogen, try to achieve hydrogen production through more greener processes. So what they do is, if you see countries like Australia leading the game here by having 96 plant, this is by 2022 records, producing hydrogen and exporting them into some other countries as well. Because you can see demand is from China and South. Because it's basically for their industries and some other applications. So you can see, especially developed countries such as Australia, Germany, taking the advantage of producing this and try to get the leadership in the industry at this moment in terms of producing green hydrogen. For Where are we at this moment? I think there's a guideline has come out in Sri Lanka as well. We call it Sri Lanka National Hydrogen Roadmap. It's a good sign. At least we have the framework done, initial framework done. This is a path when we are thinking about next stage of the country, whose Sri Lankan economy especially. This is a possibility that our decision makers can think about in when it's come to country's economy at least in South Asian region, we can be a leader in terms of hydrogen production. Even though this is a miracle fuel or miracle material, I will say why in my one before last slide, I will explain why I'm calling this a miracle material. There are issues with this, especially starting with the technology, because we still don't understand clearly how we can produce this in a greener manner. 
there are challenges many ways so we don't understand clearly the process even developed countries so that's why they are pumping billions of dollars into this sector to research on these things to understand how we will we can actually optimize these processes so that we reduce the cost of the production process the main challenge is the reducing that production cost through the my focus today is mainly taking you especially through this safety aspects of hydrogen because not like some other fuel other alternatives hydrogen is considered as flammable and considered as a explosive material i will from next slide onward i will take you in a journey on what we are doing in this space at in australian university especially production cost i'll go up to next slide and come back i read this two days ago this published in two days ago you can see cost of producing green hydrogen has gone up by 30 to 65 percent due to multiple factors this is the article i read two days ago mainly due to higher labor and material cost so it's still this is a challenge because if you want to replace other fuel or, and consider hydrogen as an alternative we need to bring down this operational cost and some other capital cost as well so this is the challenge we have in front of us in this industry as we all know hydrogen is reactive material when it's come to contact with some other material so in terms of storages you can't design with a concrete storage and put hydrogen into it. porosity as well as the reactivity can influence that But still it's not going to work either so this is a challenge so how can we store this so storage production is a challenge as well generally we go for high strength composite generally clad uh, steel containers cladded with hydrogen uh, fiber reinforced material composites are the best choice for this one there are many ways people have invested money to develop this this concepts in special developed countries the other challenge we have is not like some other fuels we need to build the infrastructure from ground zero because there's nothing exist even in developed countries so we need to think about before we bring this material into the market this option into the market we need to build the infrastructure i have seen recently toyota has already manufactured a car with hydrogen engine it's almost there in the in they are ready to come to the market but question is where are the fuel stations do we have them even developed country like australia we don't have them completely arranged in the cities i won't go through all others there are many other challenges we have in hydrogen sector what we will find answers next decade or so now especially i'm focusing my lecture today or the keynote speech today on hydrogen safety hydrogen is a considerably hazardous material can ignite very quickly and cause significant damage within quick time there are two incidents i have highlighted here one is sandvik vika norway in 2019 and santa clara in usa again 2019 two incident one is in a hydrogen pumping station completely destroyed due to explosion within the facility other one is when the driver is pumping hydrogen into the, the tanks something has leaked and caused the explosion and subsequently the fire 
So this there are incident reported since 1960s. You can see gradually increased the number of incident, but suddenly 2010 to 2020, the numbers has decreased. I believe this is a there's an influence of from COVID shutdown into this. Maybe next decade we can see significant increment in these numbers purely because hydrogen become more and more popular now and people are trying different various things with hydrogen. Incident can go significantly higher in next decade. So when we are dealing with hydrogen infrastructure, we need to think about safety. That's what we are focusing as academic group at UNSW Canberra at this moment. Jointly with University of Bulongo, we have a project defined for this area and we are conducting experiment. That's the journey I'm trying to take you through next 10 to 15 minutes. So as I mentioned before, hydrogen is highly flammable. As well as the, with even with 10% of hydrogen, it can cause create a high explosion if that material ignite with the ignition source. So this is the challenge. There's a need to be high percentage of hydrogen. It varies in a wide range, 10 to 70% roughly, hydrogen to air or hydrogen to oxygen ratios. So within that range, hydrogen can create an explosion and fire easy. Then we have challenges always to develop a sustainable system for hydrogen storage. What is this hydrogen embrittlement? Generally, when hydrogen contact any material, especially steel, it's going into the microstructure and create increased porosity by creating cavities within the material. It's almost like eroding the material within the microstructure. So ma material gradually become weaker with the contact of hydrogen. So that's why we can't use hydrogen with steel chambers or steel structures directly because over the time, hydrogen, the, the steel structure can be, or become weaker than what you design initially. So generally, we store this material under high pressure, weaker structure. We know the, the consequences after that can create or explode and create fatal damage to the surrounding as well. I like to highlight this good example. Now, do we really need ignition source for hydrogen to create an explosion? What do you think? Answer is no. If you transport hydrogen in small vessels, as given in this figure here, there's an accident when you're transporting. Generally, in these containers, hydrogen is at high pressure condition, very high pressure. It will leak into a low pressure environment because of this pressure gaps pressure gap between two environments, it can auto-ignite. This is the danger of this material. So even in a road accident situation, within few few seconds, auto-ignition can happen and create an explosion without any other external ignition source. You know, if you are working, if you have experience, especially general as well, the explosive material, chemical explosive like TNT, C4, we need to ignite it to get the explosion, right? But this is a different game in terms of the explosion mechanism. There are two main types of explosion. We call it deflagration and detonation, very simple terms. Deflagration is generally there's no chemical reaction occurs within the process. 
is just releasing the small amount of energy in subsonic condition and generally a fireball or flame propagate from the starting from the source into the surrounding environment generally we can see in terms of the over pressure versus time curve long duration less peak if you understand this in a in a real chemical explosive like tnt or c4 anything we are using in defense we get very sharp peak that's why it causes a huge damage to the surrounding but in in terms of deflagration you have low, longer duration less peak but can be catastrophic in terms of an event generally dominated by the fire fire and the flame generated from that in terms of de detonation it goes into that supersonic zone so almost creating a shock wave similar to the chemical explosive we are familiar with and can cause significant damage to the surrounding this these two events combinedly come in something called ddt we call it deflagration detonation transition when a small leak happen from a hydrogen storage within few minutes it can undergo deflagration to detonation transition automatically and create a significant damage to the surrounding without even giving you time to rescue people in the surrounding end this videos are explaining this uh, the phenomena but i won't go through the the to discuss this but general understanding is ddt to occur it should propagate certain distance through the channels for example if you are transporting this material through pipes it has enough length so that if there's a weaker point within the pipeline it can undergo this transition from deflagration to detonation and causes huge damage to the pipe network this a this is a very strange material you can see from this graph doesn't follow a regular pattern in terms of the explosion if you the, the x axis is temperature y axis is the pressure you can see under certain temperature and pressure it doesn't create an explosion the hatch the brown color zone is the explosion zone if you go into that it's create an explosion generally so it's depend on the temperature it depend on the pressure you the material is in it can create either detonation or explosion or no explosion situation into the huge physics behind this i won't go into that detail today but we can talk about it if you have any questions now to understand this material we started to do some small scale experiment jointly with university of bulongo our aim was to understand how this material behaves in a small scale detonation this is a simple laboratory test we call it unconfined detonation you can see it's a, like a soap soap bubble you take small soap liquid you create that bubble we send hydrogen into the bubble it's roughly 100 mm in diameter our aim is to create a shell and fill hydrogen inside that this shell doesn't have any strength so we call it unconfined volume of hydrogen what we are trying to do is characterize the behavior of hydrogen within unconfined space so that we can understand the basic physics of this material when it's detonated so these are the videos we captured through high speed cameras you can see how violent this material ex create explosion even in a small scale volume so what we do is we measure pressure time histories that's what we are after in this kind of experiment is like a day to day fun activities for us 
in the laboratory environment. So overpressure versus time. After doing all this experiment with C4 TNT type material, this is with the pressures given by these hydrogen bubbles are not that significant. As you can see, even a staff is, I think there's a video later. Now, next step is the large scale trials. We won't stop from there. We like, we are trying to establish field experiment to do large scale volume test. To replicate hydrogen cloud, we are going to create a small container with generally we selected from, sele outer surfaces are made out of a selected material, very thin polymer. And we will ignite this source Generally, we go for 70% hydrogen and 30% oxygen. That is the, the critical zone for us. And we will do experiment like this for hydrogen. Why we need this? There's no regulations or clearly defined guidelines for engineers to design infrastructure for hydrogen as it clearly different to some other material, explosive material, we need this data when it's come to hydrogen infrastructure development. Otherwise, there's no meaning we work on green hydrogen or hydrogen development if you can't develop the hydrogen infrastructure within quick time. So to increase the fun a bit more, so we are doing two different test programs as well. We have this, this instrument called blast simulators. So we, are, we conduct experiment within these facilities. These are confined environment. I will play some videos. You can see the work we are doing in this space. Can you finally play the video? First one. We don't have the song. So generally, these experiments are planned to get properties of hydrogen, especially under either detonation or deflagration zone. So we need them in our design guidelines. Is it OK? No, next one only, then we can turn back. Do you have the song? The next one is this. This is the small scale blast simulator we have in the laboratory environment. It's it can create a still significant damage. We generally use for this one for mine blast, or the blast occurs within a mine environment to simulate that and validate our numerical work from there. But this is the instrument, most likely. Next. This is the instrument, most likely in the next six months, I will get them the management of this one. This is in another university at this moment, but we are using it for the time being. This is called National facility for blast testing. This can generate roughly 300 kPa level uh, far field detonation effect within this chamber. You can see these chambers can be filled with hydrogen and ignite it. Then you can put your structural member inside the, the chambers. It's like wind tunnel if you are familiar with wind tunnels, but in a more higher scale, danger is high, the safety is relatively less than wind tunnel. So we do it, we can test laminated glass, we can test concrete panels, we can test many other materials in it. With sound, it's beautiful, but I think...
it's a real explosion within within laboratory environment so this national facility will be moved to unsw canberra within next 6 months this is the the project i'm currently involved in most likely we will be located in one of our facilities within canberra next within 6 months then to understand this bit more this is my one of my strong points i addressed this one yesterday's like uh, webinar as well the numerical simulations we consider as we are one of the leading teams in the world context even in terms of the numerical modeling so our aim is to simulate this laboratory experiment with numerical tools we generally use if you are familiar with high end fea i won't go into details but this example gives you the clear picture what we are trying to do it's a high traded cloud formation and explosion happens within that cloud ignition happen and the shock wave propagate and hit in the structural element and we just measure the pressure so we can go into fsi level this this kind of model and get all these deformation pressure histories and everything from this kind of model what's required for infrastructure design in hydrogen infrastructure projects generally when we are doing it it's a complex modeling technique than many other FEA you are running at this moment in consultancy environment. We need to understand chemical reaction because it's a chemical reaction process. Hydrogen react with air, either air or oxygen. Generally, we have, we learn these things in high schools, all, most of us. Nine step, it's not hydrogen plus o oxygen equal H2O. It doesn't work that way in this physics, uh, this chemistry. There are set of equations, nine model, 28 equation model, and 52 equations model. So we need to follow this path and develop these uh, uh, models so that we can actually replicate the real world scenario into modeling space. I won't go through details, but I'd like to show you a few examples we have done and validate our modeling exercise with a simple examples such as this. So you can see experimental work and the numerical works are relatively validated. This is still very early stage. We need to refine these models and develop the proper validation methodology in for future usage. Again, another example for the field experiment, we use Plex. There's another tool called Plex it's generally developed for gas explosion. We use that one to predict the overpressure acting on the or re uh, reflection pressure acting on the structural element. And we have validated that one with the given experiment as well. This is the bubble experiment I explained to you previously. Again, simple bubble formation. We have validated with the numerical. Important of these processes are you. You can understand it's not like simple experiment we are doing with some other material, for example, concrete testing. These are significantly difficult to do it even in developed country with the investment of money we are putting into these projects. So that's why numerical processes are always dominate in this space and try, if you have clear understanding about the processes, definitely these are the, the alternative options we have in, to reduce the experimental work. Just before I finish, I like to highlight this. This is the hydrogen, first ever hydrogen explosion, nuclear explosion done by USA and reported in 1952 in this magazine, Life magazine. This has happened in NV talk island one of the island in pacific ocean i think some of you may be familiar with this what do you think about when it's compared with this explosion with nagasaki explosion anyone has any clues on that this explosion is thousand times higher in terms of the capacity than nagasaki explosion the damage wise you see this red color dot here this is the Ch Chicago city map in 1952 or 1950. So this red dot 
shows the area that can, that will be damaged if that Nagasaki bomb plays in Chicago city center. The outer circle shows you, if you took this bomb into the Chicago city center, this is the radius of that will be damaged completely by this hydrogen explosion. So you can understand the magnitude of hydrogen or the energy that this material can carry when it's come to either nuclear explosion or normal detonation type explosion. This is a higher end one. We won't get this unless someone is. But my question to everybody is, now we are moving towards hydrogen as a fuel. Hydrogen techni technology can go into the unwanted people's hand as well in future. Weapons can be developed. We don't know this yet. And something like this can be possible even in our life. So this is the numbers. If you want to have a read on this, thousand times powerful than the Nagasaki bomb. That I think with that, this is my team working on this project. Is the team leader, Professor Alex Remenikov. He's one of the leading experts in protective structure. I'm working closely with him. These are other members. And we had a fun uh, event in Sydney, closer to Sydney Harbor Bridge. All these people contributed to this work. So I won't name individually, but they all, it's a team effort. And I'd like to thank you for listening to me this afternoon or evening, actually. Any questions? I'm happy to answer when it's given time at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Damit. Let's express our sincere appreciation to Dr. Damit Mohoti for that enlightening and thought-provoking keynote address on hydrogen as an alternative fuel in the future, designing safer hydrogen infrastructure. The third session on the agenda is the Mass Timber for Tall Buildings in the Future, conducted by Professor Priyan Mendes. Priyan Mendes is a professor of civil engineering at the University of Melbourne and a structural engineering consultant. He worked as a structural engineer at Cornell Wagner in Melbourne before joining the University of Melbourne in 1990s. He has been an expert consultant for the design of tall buildings in Australia and overseas, including some of the tallest buildings in the world, and an active participant in CTBUH since the early 1990s. He's also an expert on fire design and protection and a key member of the CTBUH Fire and Facade Committee. He is presently leading many projects in that area. In 2020 and 2021, he was included in a database of the top 2% researchers worldwide, prepared by authors of Stanford University. I now invite Professor Priyan to conduct his session on mass timber. Uh, thank you, uh, Ronald, for that very kind introduction. And uh, again, thank you to CTBH, uh, the committees here, organizing committee, uh, led by uh, engineer Shiromal, uh, I think architect Nirodha is here, and Mr. Ruan, and of course, Ronald Lee as the coordinator. So uh, it's a very, it's a timely topic, uh, the sustainable cities for the future. We had two very good presentations. One on the healthy buildings, which really uh, in the quality healthy buildings, Professor Lou, uh, and uh, again, my close friend, and also Dr. Damit uh, worked with me for a time, long time. And uh, it's it's really uh, on the hydrogen, which is really had to be a, a part of the, the future cities infrastructure. So it's really timely. And also uh, all the other distinguished uh, guests, uh, Actually, uh, actually, we all are well known to me and good friends here. 
very senior people as well as uh, uh, like the junior. And also I'm very proud today. I think I got three of my former PhD students here doing very well. And actually, of course, Dr. Damit, uh, I think engineer Tarindu was here as well. He must be here or he was here before. And also I had to really acknowledge uh, is Monash, uh, Monash University, Malaysia, head of civil engineering. I think uh, uh, SS Professor uh, Suzashan Raman, who worked work with me for, for a long time, and thank you very much for coming all the way to this talk. And anyone going to want to go to KL to study is Monash, KL is, as you know, a very good place. You must talk to, talk to him as well. So uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, again, this is a topic can uh, something we can't avoid. I like to bring something new all the time, every time, but I try my best every year. But uh, the so this is a topic that we can't uh, ignore uh, in the world. Uh, that is uh, uh, the the timber. We know the COP twenty eight. Uh, if you if you look at the carefully what happened in Dubai a few weeks back, it's really. Uh, so they were talking about built, built environment is 40% uh, uh, of emissions. And we have been talking about this. Uh, and when we formed our Green Building Council of Sri Lanka in 2009, uh, some of the founders are here as well. Uh, the We know uh, it's long way we have gone, but now the big picture we know it's uh, whatever, whoever it is in AEC, we call architects, engineers, construction industry is a key. So we are responsible for uh, that 40%. So how do we do that and how to reduce that? To get these goals, we had to attack the building industry. Attack means not in a negative way, not to stop any buildings. It is the problem as well as a solution. Who's providing solution? That's why we are here. We are the ones who are going to provide the solution. So uh, it's really equally important for architects as well as engineers, uh, and been there for some time now, uh, leading some of the pioneer, uh, the pioneer work in Australia on the prefabrication. Uh, then now I'm actually heavily involved with the, yeah, the Research Council Future Timber Hub. Uh, uh, so materials, I think we had to start thinking. We have started, uh, we have changed our, our uh, the way we teach uh, structural engineering in our campus, which I was part of it, changing our curriculum. We don't care about which material we think the the because the same thing. What is the performance required by the material and the type of material? And then we work backwards. And it doesn't matter. It can be steel, concrete, timber. That's what I'm going to talk talk today. And um, the very quickly because we don't want to. No, we want to listen like Q and A, especially for the first two speakers as well. So uh, I'll see. Maybe it's working. It's working. Uh, so, oh, so jump there. Uh, okay, I'll talk, start with this. Anyway, modular construction, I will not talk today. There's a talk, uh, invited talk by AIT. They invite the experts in different areas to talk. Uh, AIT Bangkok, uh, uh, it was COVID, so I had to do online. So you'll see in the YouTube if you want to learn about modular construction. So today, I will not talk about that too much. Uh, the so these were the timber, as I said, the COP28, one of the main uh, main conclusions is we had to increase our timber construction, design and construction in, in the buildings and uh, I know infrastructure other could be slightly difficult, but buildings, this is my prediction, uh, every building will have a timber component in the future, another five years time, uh, or it could be, uh, so that's why it's very relevant to Sri Lanka. And we have been, uh, when I was growing up here, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about timber. Uh, we had from our grandfathers, grandmothers, the lots of timber. It's been very sustainable, durable, right? Our, all that, you know, we were all very proud to say this 100 years old, 200 years old. It was very durable and teak and uh, everything. Uh, so uh, even the other type of timber, so we have been using here in timber for a long time. And only thing is then actually because of the humidities and the durability issues, all that. So we have to be careful here. 
and the termites and all that. So be in the timber construction. So I don't mean that uh, we are getting rid of concrete or timber, uh, sorry, steel. It's a wrong impression in the world that we are go going to have timber timber buildings, 100% timber buildings. It's we hybrid in the future. So it'll, it'll come. Every project in the concepts, we have to consider uh, the timber as in some components now. That's happening in every country and it'll, it, it'll come here as well. So we will have a, a future in that. This is one of the modular timber ones. And uh, even the modular construction, we had started looking at, we have been using light gauge steel or concrete in this case, because the weight we have gone for light gauge steel. Modulus, the prefabricator is, is pop, getting popular as well. It is definitely the future. Uh, we will see a bit more prefabricated elements. We can really have, uh, again, there are, are actually very senior architects in this audience. And uh, uh, we have the, we'll know as well, this, just, you can have anything, just uh, uh, any type of structure within the modular structure. So timber is a good alternative. For, for this. So I'll take you through the journey of timber today uh, with very quickly, very, it's a blitz uh, presentation. And uh, there are type of mass timber. Mass timber means large timber components. I'll tell you the reason why this mass timber name came. Uh, so it can be nail laminated, connected with nails, cross laminated timber. Uh, so we call it glue laminated timber, gluing that together. Uh, now, the, I'll tell, uh, this is going to be very popular, the cross-laminate timber. I'll have some one slide there. And uh, it can be a composite. It can be uh, timber and concrete composites as well. And the structural composites, and uh, it's uh, so different type of composites. So the timber, uh, is uh, why we have been saying is, we think it burns, right? Let's let's not worry about it. Let's It is burning and... Uh, and that's the reason it didn't come, become popular. So when you think of carefully, when the timber uh, burns, there's a char layer being formed. Now in steel, we use fire protection. Right? The, and it's similar. It's a natural fire protection, the char. So it's not too bad. We think it's bad, but uh, it's, it's a, a timber can, of course, burn, uh, burn quickly. However, the, the char layer is quite important. That's why the our analytical work, everything will become extremely important. Uh, my group, uh, we have about four PhD students working in all aspects of timber, uh, among other things. So cross-laminated, well, to quickly go through very quickly, it is um, really what's happening. Usually you have the, the planks in one direction, but in this case, uh, let's, let's go in two directions and we improve the strength very quickly. So by doing that, that's why we can build a bit more taller because of this, uh, the innovations in the cross laminations. We were used to only single directions, but now going cross directions and we can really uh, build stronger. So these are the definitions coming from the international building code that you, there, but uh, it's, it's really, I, I will not uh, spend time on that. So uh, again, cross laminate timber, it's a large lightweight panels, dimension stable, uh, the CNC machines and all that, the available, uh, again, it can be exposed. Again, there is far more, uh, we got experts here, as I said, it's more, uh, it can be exposed, architecturally exposed and fast on-site construction. So CLT is getting very popular. And some of the examples to run through, uh, to say it can be panels, it can be all sort of construction can be done very quickly going through some of that type uh, to acknowledge the woodworks council, gravity framing styles, uh, mass timber framing systems. Uh, Today is just a blitz, as I said, happy to talk a bit more on these things. But so there are different type of gravity systems. Uh, I'm talking about getting taller and taller uh, with this, uh, the timber and uh, uh, some of the some systems, there are post and beam systems, post and beam connections have to be done carefully, but we uh, can be done. And uh, so the post and the beam systems, uh, and we have the flow systems as well, CLT type of flooring systems, 
we had a project and now patent in our department on the acoustics as well. Acoustic is a, not my, uh, like I, 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 it's part of the center that I'm running, Campage, but it was done by a, a couple of other staff members. Uh, now on the acoustic side, uh, the, the, the post uh, and the beam system and the uh, uh, different systems are there. Second one, very quickly, two-way panel deck systems. Uh, so that's one of the examples, going taller and taller, uh, the, uh, the the deck systems, panel and deck system, without the, the post and the beams, without beams, like the flat slabs we are used to in concrete. Uh, so like similar system, there are a few examples like that. Hybrid light frame and mass timber sections, and like that, the light light frame. You can do anything with this this the missing material. The so in this case, CLT a flow uh, and light frame walls. We are used to that. Uh, we can can do that. So different examples like that. Mass timber walls. So we can have mass timber walls. All that are mass timber walls. And uh, so we are doing it now. In, in other parts of the world. I think it should come to Sri Lanka. The uh, uh, the redstone the building there and the candle was sued, so uh, there. And then actually we are talking about the hybrid systems, the mass timber and the, the steel framings and the mass timber, but the steel framing. As I said, people go and say, just timber buildings, you don't need to have. You could just uh, mix of hybrid. That's what I'm uh, gonna mention a bit more today. And the connections had to be done properly. And I will not go through the detail. It's uh, some of the connections. You can connect with some metal angles. Uh, and, uh, and But you have to really analyze this and carefully do that, especially going, going taller. I'll come to, come to the taller. Of course, getting taller, you need to look at the lateral load resistance systems. Uh, you need to look at the wind uh, could dominate and also the earthquakes. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in the world and the research side as well, uh, in, in terms of both uh, architects and engineers, both had to do a bit more work to really get this uh, popular. And the lateral force systems, the vertical, horizontal, and we had talked about some code systems, recognized systems, as well as innovative systems. I'm looking at the time, I need to go quickly on this. The lateral framing systems, uh, the, the again, the in this case, the it can be hybrid, as I said. So in this case, the, the concrete wall, so we should know we have mixed uh, steel and concrete to other composites. So here, the concrete walls, we should have some connections, uh, proper connections. And the other thing is, uh, this is what Sri Lanka also, the work been done, the, the axial shortenings and all that, getting taller. Concrete will shorten. It's a living material, concrete. Timber may shorten, not as much as in in that vertical direction. So we have a lot of things to resolve before we're getting very tall. It's going to happen. We can't avoid. So, but we, so especially for younger people who want to do a bit more work, whether you're working with the consulting or, or other ways, uh, academic institutions, a lot of work to be done in the future. So the, the exterior steel moment frame, we can have a hybrid systems like that for the lateral framing systems uh, and also, the some of the examples of the steel frame systems joined with combined with uh, with uh, with timber, and uh, again the innovative systems as well you can have some new innovations getting into to the timber, and and, and it can be done. So uh, there are again I will not talk too much. Uh, we started doing some work on this, that is the. Uh, there's a response modification fact response factors for seismic. We know we are used to in the in concrete steels. We don't know enough of timber yet. Uh, so this has to be done to really get taller as well. Even in Sri Lanka or anywhere we have low moderate to low to moderate zones, the uh, the earthquake. We don't know the proper R values yet. So if you want to do that, there are some assumptions can be made. But the under, especially under seismic, all that. So a lot of work had to be done in these areas, uh, and so this is where the the hybrid systems are there. 
And this is where we are moving now, towards taller and taller. And there's a, uh, there was a race to build the tallest building uh, in the world. Uh, and we know that, uh, now talk about Burj Khalifa, uh, we have run through the journey. But then the Jeddah Tower, when it's constructed, it's not yet. But uh, it could be one kilometer. Uh, there was a concept that I was part of an expert group in some discussions in uh, to talk about uh, two kilometers. And during COVID, we had through uh, through uh, the Zoom conversations on how to build a two two kilometers. So in in sorry in the Middle East, like uh, not allowed to say too much on that. But it's a very preconceived stage. But uh, anyway, coming back to all that, so we can do tall buildings, one kilometer, two meters, as we can do that. But the, what we can't do is also with the timber coming in, uh, that I think there'll be a, another parameter. We have to consider timber for uh, some elements in the, these buildings. Uh, so there are some coming through 17 stories uh, in the CTBH in Singapore, it was presented as well in other forums, the Atlassian Sydney headquarters are getting a bit more taller. Uh, and we just completed, uh, we means not me, I was not involved in this, but the uh, oh, involved means as a, yes, academic, we had uh, done some analysis for, for this building, but uh, the, the 15 stories uh, just completed. So we are getting taller and taller. So in this case, the issues I will mention just announced the 191 meter. Uh, this is this is now advertised as the world's tallest timber building, but it could be a hybrid. But it's all right. It'll be it's in Perth, so 50 uh, story building just announced 191 meters. So uh, as a, the first tallest timber tower, and uh, again there'll be a Lemberg first with well known architects from origin start from Melbourne. Uh, there will be the architects. So anyway, what is preventing in these two minutes is the uh, international building codes are changing. We are allowed in Australia, uh, I'm also the, one of the committees, but allowed in Australia up to uh, uh, eight stories. About 25 meters we allow in timber now. But the the again, this IBC 2021 uh, now allowing up to 18 stories. You need to have some fire protection, right? The uh, Again, I'll leave it to another day for this to uh, explain, but we can protect with plasterboard, all that, the timber, but then timber is charring, as I said, having mass timber, you can design to be mass timber. I'll come back to the definition. Why mass timber is, mass means you have heavy mass timber, even if it burns, it will really, doesn't matter, like because the charring layer may protect it, uh, and also the the team, the fire loads are uh, low, lower than the ultimate. Again, going to detail design loads. Fire loads in our code are one point zero g uh, uh, plus uh, live load. Part of the line load. They say point four live load. We use one point one or one one g, but the ultimate, as you know, is uh, again Australian code. If you use one point two g dead load plus one point five live load. So fire loads are less. But then uh, we can do performance-based designs to other things and protect this structure. We may have to use for 18 stories. So first time in the world, 18 stories is allowed. And uh, but you have to protect uh, protect this. But again, up to five stories, you don't need uh, even sprinklers. But in this case, the sprinkler sprinklers have to be used as well in some way. And uh, there's a, a presentation in the Candy Conference on active and uh, 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 the passive fire, uh, like balancing those two things. Uh, and also the, uh, oh, what, what I'm doing, sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, the It's actually the last slide, uh, no, last two slides, but very quickly I'll finish. So uh, 18 stories, we can go to with some protection. And uh, again, the hybrid systems, now we can go even taller uh, with the hybrid system. So we will see, See, uh, this is something, uh, you know, just, it's a bit more detail. If you're using, first time the uh, 4A was introduced where you can go to higher levels, but uh, uh, in the IBC, but you need to, to do a bit more other things to really protect the, uh, protect the building. So we'll see some uh, of the 
changes happening next few years. Something to look for, exciting, but which we don't have any option. We have to consider mass timber for buildings. May take a little bit of time here to really uh, there, but uh, world is moving very quickly, as I said. No choice. Timber is 18 countries have signed off. Main countries uh, have signed off already uh, in, in COP uh, in Dubai. And this is going to be happening, right? So we'll have a look at it in the world next few years. That's all, right? Thank you, Professor Priyan, for that uh, great presentation. Uh, since we have limited amount of time, we can take two to three uh, questions if anyone has any. If not, you can send me your questions uh, to the CTBUH email and we will respond to it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Can we? Good evening, I'm Hindukit Ratna, architect. Uh, I'd like to ask a question from Dr. Damit. How do you produce the hydrogen? You are talking about hydrogen. How do you produce it? It's a good question. Okay. Uh, at this moment, we are using uh, industry level hydrogen supply to do the experiment. We are not producing any green hydrogen or anything at this moment because we are mainly looking into safety side, not the production side. So in terms of our usage, we are using industry produce hydrogen. Maybe I can answer a little bit, uh, it's more on the, uh, Dr. Damit is expert on the, the protection side, but on the uh, really producing, so the water has to be broken for the green hydrogen. So we started with some uh, brown hydrogen and all that, but now we talk about green hydrogen for the future. So water has to be broken and the H2 component is separated. Now there's a question, uh, there's some discussion in Australia. We are talking about the, uh, the we don't have enough water. How are we going to, uh, to break the water? But uh, again, actually, thank you for that. But we have an industry project on really what's called gray, the uh, uh, the brown hydrogen that is using some other chemical pyrolysis ways of producing hydrogen, but people are moving towards green hydrogen. So uh, no, not brown actually from the, the from the water, breaking the water, not ground water actually. The the water has to be fresh water. Yeah, of course, the fresh water has to be broken to uh, to really get the hydrogen. And then, of course, it's all Dr. Damit's really work on uh, explosions and all that, right? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's the correct answer, like, uh, because that's why it is it is called as most available element, like material, so that we can use for any food. So it's mainly because of the water is water is available anywhere so it just need to break down the production that's the, the the current challenge is the production cost so how can we get the water and break into that level is the question so production cost reduces means hydrogen will be cheaper then it will come to market regularly at this moment that's what researched by many research group in the world how to bring this down in terms of the cost of production thanks do we have any other questions? My question. Yeah, my question is to Professor Priyan Mindy. Uh, I just want to know whether have you done any comparative studies on the cost of uh, timber building, timber wood, and the the traditional type of Building. Extremely good question. And world is not ready to answer all those questions. And even CTBH in Singapore, 
uh, we were discussing that uh, and our presentation of the hybrid timber. Uh, the previous conference had all mass timber. Uh, I know when we went to uh, previous one is, I remember correctly, in Chicago before COVID. And we were, dis uh, like we means the group over there was discussing on the, uh, the so uh, now it's a hybrid model. So it's a very good question you're answer, answering, asking. So it's, it can be answered in both ways. Uh, the sustainability component is a big one. So I didn't go into detail, but timber absorbs carbon dioxide as well as uh, the soil sequestration of the of the the timber the the trees. So carbon numbers are very low. So it's not really a, a just a cost now. Carbon will have a big cost in the future. So uh, the some comparisons we have done some simple comparisons of uh, again I think one of our papers on steel versus concrete uh, how many years back we wrote 2010 I think the on uh, quantification so quantification embodied carbon as well as the operational carbon uh, Professor Lou brought the operational side I had my embodied carbon side but then we we really did a very good paper but the so yeah. The, what I'm, it's a very good question uh, on the quantities, but at the moment, uh, yes, uh, it's easy to build in concrete. Uh, we know that still, but but the timber is becoming a di bit difficult. But with the had to be done, and the carbon cost will be added to the normal cost in the future. So that way, there's no uh, we we will have additional calculations that will be done. So the carbon numbers are already been calculated. The not only the green ratings, uh, the to get the green ratings six to seven to all that, the so it's really been getting really the value of the buildings are going up like the healthy buildings we talked about, the the absolute talked about the the costs are going up so it is a very good question so uh, that carbon cost when you add yes it's definitely a, a be lower cost. Any other questions from the forum? All right. As we come to the end of the session, we would like to thank the keynote speakers of the night, Professor Liu Professor Priyan Mendes, and Dr. Damit Mohoti uh, for taking your time to be here. Our chief guest for the evening, General Prasad Samarasinghe. Our guests of honor, Professor Ranjit Disanayaka, Architect Jayanta Pereira, Architect Rohana Herat, and Dr. Karuna Ratna. Our sponsors for CTB were 2023, Hilti, Haley's Aventura, and uh, Captain Steel. We also thank BMICH for the space. Last but not least, the organizing committee for their hard work. <laughs>